This is the StoryWorks Roundtable, where we have conversations about craft. Because becoming a successful author begins with writing a great story. Hello and welcome to this week's StoryWorks Roundtable. I am delighted to have an in-depth conversation with author and world traveler Meg Diamond. Meg has been traveling since her mother took her to live in Italy from ages 11 to 14. She has traveled extensively in Europe and Central America and ventured such exotic landscapes as India, Cambodia, Bhutan, Japan, Kenya, China, Burma, Vietnam, Thailand, and Cuba. In her 70s now, she continues traveling most recently to Machu Picchu and the Amazon jungle. After a career teaching writing to college students in San Francisco and Taos, she often volunteers as a writing tutor at 826 Valencia, an esteemed literacy program launched by Dave Eggers. She has been a practicing Buddhist for 20 years and is a dedicated member of Spirit Rock Meditation Center north of San Francisco. Meg's memoir, Bowing to Elephants, has been honored by Kirkus Review as one of the best indie memoir biographies of 2019, where it received a starred review. Prior to publication, excerpts from Bowing to Elephants were honored in American Literary Review, Travelers, Tales Solace Awards, The Tulip Tree, Stories That Must Be Told Awards, and the 2017 William Faulkner Wisdom Awards. Additionally, Diamond publishes essays in Elephant Journal. You can find her essays on her website, magdiamond.com. Uh, Diamond is offering a 10-minute loving-kindness meditation for all new readers at bowingtoelephants.com slash gift. And in addition to all of that, Meg, you have recently started a Facebook Live series of interviews called Writers Coming Together, which is fantastic. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming to the roundtable. Well, thanks for inviting me. I'm delighted. <laughs> Excellent. Well, so... Um, I'm curious about your process of discovery as you wrote your memoir. Your introduction sounds, reads like a letter to the reader, setting us up for the journey we're about to go on. And it seems you began writing travel essays that ended with the memoir. And so many of us sit down to write one thing and end up with something completely different, whether it's the form or the content. Uh, our work kind of shifts under our feet. So can you tell us about your journey from, I guess, wherever you want to start? Since this is memoir, we'll be talking about your journey throughout this conversation. So, <laughs> Well, you know, it all came about because um, um, every, tri every trip I ever took, I documented it, uh, you know, by keeping a journal. Um, and I did that, of course, because I knew that I would never remember everything. And I have this sort of insatiable need, this need to, um, to remember stuff so that I can then kind of re-experience it in my own way and share it, of course. And so I had just, you know, these stacks of journals uh, from different trips. And um, I decided when I was... Um, in conversation with my Buddhist teacher, actually, we were talking about getting things done in our life. And, um, and he and I were here, I are the same age. And I said, you know, I really want to write a book. And, um, and he said, well, you know, Mag, you're at the time of your life where uh, this was by sort of uh, mid 60s at this point. Mm -hmm. And, and, and he said, you got to stop talking about doing things <laughs> at your age, and you got to just do them. And so I found this great group to, uh, to be a part of a writing community called Write to the Finish. And they have a nine month course that you can uh, embark on with them. And the goal is to complete a manuscript. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I leapt into that. I knew the person who was running it. I was very excited. And I had all these journals and I thought, I'm just gonna write this great series of 
travel essays. And, you know, everybody loves to uh, have armchair travel experiences and um, especially people that don't go on many trips. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, that's, that's what it's going to be. It's just going to be this collection of, of witty, insightful, colorful essays. And I started doing this and I picked out the countries that I really wanted to focus on. And as I started kind of taking the material from the journals and putting it on into my computer, uh, these voices started to come up in in me and they were the voices of my past. They Mm. were people in my past, like my grandmother, like my mother, um, like my best friend Sue, who I've known since we were four. And they were uh, responding to my efforts and they were putting in their sort of their energies. And I realized that the, that the essays uh, were not the whole, the whole deal. And that I really mm-hmm. had to write a story that was in, in several lay in a couple of layers. And that would be both adventure and then back what I would call the big backstory, which is, which is my past and, and my conditioning and what happened to me to make me this kind of fanatical adventurer in the world. Mm-hmm. Well, um, so did you have a model in mind for this book? Were you thinking, oh, I've read so-and-so's memoir and here's a structure that I can adapt? Or was it, was it a completely organic process coming from your muse or from these voices of the past? How did you... Uh, maybe for listeners who haven't read the book, how would you describe the structure of your book? And then how did you come to land on that structure? Well, um, I, it, it's in 10 chapters and it starts out with, with Italy because Italy was where I started to, my traveling life in a sense. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and each chapter is then, um, there is a sort of a scaffolding uh, of, of travel and then there's backstory um, because um, I wanted to show, I wanted to share um, what happened to me as a child to make me so incredibly curious and so hung- hungering for, uh, for new experiences. Mm-hmm. The Italy chapter, but backing up a second, the Italy chapter, which is the beginning, actually is it does not have that structure but every other chapter has this structure where i start out uh like i'm in paris and i start out you know in paris talking about food and and going to see monet and all that and then i go back and i remember my life as a little kid when my mother was an abstract painter and i remember Mm -hmm. the smell of paint and so i talk about my mother's life as an artist and how that affected me and then i go back and I wrap the chapter has a symmetry because in the end I go back to the travel adventure. So there's this little container with the, with the backstory kind of in the center of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's and I had no model for this. I just knew that they had that these things they had to be woven together. Right. And it was and it was very tricky in a way because you had to you create transitions so as not to confuse the reader because you, you're going from being in Paris in 2000 and you know 13 or whatever and then you're back in San Fran- and then you're in San Francisco in 19 you know 55 uh, you know mm-hmm. and 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 I did little you know little mini uh, sections within each chapter and I tried to give headings that were clear but when right. you're making that transition you have to be very careful to to not, you know, Mm -hmm. not confuse the reader. Right. It did work. I did not ever feel confused or lost about the transitions. You know, the white space and the headers were great. Did anyone, it is such an unusual form. I'm wondering as you were um, working with writing mentors or critique groups, did anyone say, oh no, this doesn't make sense or rethink this or was it all encouragement all the way? Well, I think, I think a lot of what happened is that people asked me questions. Uh, you know, we had these small group, um, you know, uh, opportunities for, for us to get pretty constant feedback and response. And, uh, and then the teachers that were running the, the thing, they also gave their own, 
responses. And, and um, I kept asking people, I mean, the, I was, you know, I was dogged about it. I said, is this clear or, or are anybody getting lost? And, and there were places where people would say, you could make this smoother going from, you know, the, in a sense, the present, uh, mm -hmm. not totally the present, but the present uh, for the sake of the narrative and then going back in time. Um, and, 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 and you're linking it because of sort of emotional, psychological energy. And so you're, you're, you're kind of pointing the way. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, so in a couple of instances, people would say you could, you might want to mention this and then, and then, you know, ease yourself that way into that next section. Mm -hmm. um, and then in other instances, I sort of figured out, it, it was the big challenge of doing the book. I mean, it was, right. but I knew that I had to, I knew that I had to have these people from my past in mm -hmm. my book because they're all a part of me and, and they've all influenced me, you know, profoundly. Right. Yeah. Right. And you, you set up the reader for this, you declare it in that first chapter, you say, um, uh, you know, in each chapter, well, I have three little excerpts and I'll just read them all because I think they're uh, all useful. I discovered in my search that I needed to move backward and forward in time in order to find the through line of my narrative. In the end, it was the story of discovering my authentic self and learning how to love by exploring foreign lands. In each chapter, I've woven together my present day travel stories with those emotional scenarios from my childhood and adolescence that had pushed me to become a traveler. It's a nice way of bringing the reader into your narrative and setting us up for this nonlinear experience, this journey that we go on with you. And one of the things I loved about your memoir is that you didn't spell everything out for me, you know? So you would have a section, um, you mentioned your mother's passion for art and painting, and you had a section about Monet's lilies, water lilies, and you spent a good deal of time describing the light and the museum and his garden and such. And then there's that, that section break, and we're in San Francisco, and your mother is off to art classes. And as a reader, I enjoyed the process of thinking there's more here than painting, right? It's not just he was a painter, she was a painter or an art student. There's that, that emotional journey there. Um, I don't know, would you like to say anything about those emotional connections that you were discovering as you wrote what that, what that was like or? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing, the, it's interesting because I've just been writing about my mother again late, uh, recently. I'm, I'm putting together another kind of book that's, that, that, that I think will be discrete essays. But anyway, I've been thinking about my mother again and about mm -hmm. her career, her very short-lived career as, a, as an artist. Um, and it, that was a very emotional thread. And I, because I realized in, as I was writing, um, I don't know when exactly I realized it. And I was talking about the Monet and, and how much I am going to art museums is one of my absolute favorite things to do wherever uh -huh. I find myself. So, and I, and I know why, and it's because I looked at art in the very, from the very beginning when I was seven and eight years old, I was looking at these incredible paintings that my mother did mm -hmm. that were in my house. I mean, they were in my, where I lived and, and I could go up and touch them and I talk about how tactile they are. And so, it, and it made me feel like it's despite the immense disappointment that happened with me and my, between my mother and me, mm -hmm. and on my part, because of her sort of narcissism and her lack of mothering, I was, when I realized there was this wonderful link between my love of art and her, Mm -hmm. made me feel so good because it was like then then it wasn't a her life wasn't a loss you know I mean she died young she had liver disease she you mm -hmm. know it was I felt it was a tragedy what happened to her uh and it was something I couldn't prevent 
but um, but the the idea that she planted this seed for me that became this big rich part of my life mm -hmm. was was very moving to me and and I dedicated you know she's in the I dedicated the book to her and to my grandmother mm -hmm. right. they they are the two major you know characters of my past um, who I think have shaped me and and given me so much, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that comes through in the narrative. Their presence is um, is consistent, if not constant. I think we always feel them. In this narrative, were you aware of this role in your life, this influence before you sat down to do the writing of, you know, the travelogue and then their voices came forward and you realized there was this other story to tell? I think I sort of knew it, you know, I, um, I had given up being angry at my mother, which was, of course, a healthy thing. Mm -hmm. And she died back in 91. So that's quite a long time ago now. But um, I, I think I knew that I certainly knew the connections between the, the nurturing of my grandmother and, and some of the loves of my life, like playing the piano, which of course, I talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in another part, uh, uh, that 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 gift to me of music and the feeling of creative outlet, emotional outlet, that all happened because my grandmother was present there, playing music, and and I wanted to be as close to her as possible. So I think I knew those things, but then when I was writing it, I got more, I got more kind of you know, I, I inhabited that time back then. Mm -hmm. And I remembered what it was like to sit at the piano with my grandmother and, and how special I felt. And, um, you know, I was an only child, so I didn't have a lot of, you know, sort of outside, I mean, distractions or uh, things pulling me different ways. And, mm -hmm. um, and I grew up sort of fast, I think, but, um, but the reliving of some of the, those past things, like even remembering what it was like to go up to next to my mother's painting and and smell the oil paint because it the mm. oil paint the oil was that that was a smell that sort of stayed for a very long time. Uh huh. And and to touch it and and to, to sort of feel its mysteriousness. Um. Yeah, it became more intense when I was writing it because I really mm -hmm. did kind of try to go back and be the child of eight, you know, be the child of right. you know, whatever, 10 years old. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your, your writing is so sensual. You do a beautiful job with your descriptions of light and art and food. You know, you get such a sensory experience um, reading this memoir. Did you, did you have any sort of practices to help you? You know, I know you're a meditator and you talk about meditation in the book to help you go back in your memories and unlock some of those um, elements that then make it into your narrative. That's a really good question. And uh, I've been asked that before, you know, and I, uh, I will say that mindfulness practice helps me um, be in my body. And so if I can place my body, um, I can place my body back in when I was this eight-year-old, you know, with my mm -hmm. grandmother, um, sitting in the living room, for instance, when she told me my parents were going to be divorced, uh, mm -hmm. I, could, uh, I could really uh, feel into that experience. And I remembered every detail of her of her home of her living room and mm. what it was like now that's not true of a lot of uh, bits and pieces of my past sure. but much that was associated with my grandmother i remembered vividly the physical detail for instance um so it the, i but i think this capacity i have to focus and to be in in the moment helped me kind of stay in those in that moment and try to and try to just imagine that I was this kid and what would I be feeling at that time? And rather than 
looking back on that kid, try to just mm -hmm. be that kid. And then, um, and then right from that place. Mm -hmm. you know, it, was, it was an interesting experience. It, 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 I mean, there's times when it was more of a stretch for me. Sure. But I still tried to make it work. I still tried to kind of go into that zone and, and be there and, um, and remember the particulars, you know. Mm -hmm. I remembered how I used to love to go through my, my mother's dresser drawer. I, you know, she, I was very nosy as a kid and I would go through her dresser drawer and I, I described that in the book and I, uh, and I would look at all the odd things that, that she placed in this, you know, they were, wasn't always logical what was in the dresser <laughs> drawer. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I loved being able to actually just be with that thing and remember the dresser. I actually have the dre that very same dresser now. And I think having some of these old things, like I have some really old photographs of people and I have, I have the journal that I first started writing when I was 11 that my stepfather gave me when I was mm -hmm. when we went to Europe. So I have these old relics, you know, and they help me kind of do that tr traveling back into that place. Right. Right. How much of your work as a memoirist was um, research going back to the journals or back to the you know, the mindfulness practice to embody that experience versus using creative license and imagination or um, fact checking things, you know, Googling what year did this happen in that country kind of. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, there was a little bit of that, but, but, but mainly it was, um, no, it actually wasn't a lot of fact checking. I, I did do some inventing. I did do some, I made up things like, um, like at my fr best friend's wedding, um, when I was so, felt so betrayed because she was going to marry somebody and not be my friend anymore. It was such a mm -hmm. crazy viewpoint. But I made up uh, what her mother was wearing. I, her mother was, uh, was another mother to me in a way. I was very close to this woman, Josephine. And 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 I just envisioned her in a purple tie silk, uh, mm. you know, long dress. I have no idea what she wore at that wedding, but I just made that up, you know, and, and, it, mm -hmm. and it made sense. Because I think if you have enough kernels of, 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 of vividness in, in the memory, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we all know that memory is a very sketchy thing. Right. And, and it's unreliable and everybody will tell you that, but you, you know, but you have a, enough bits and pieces that are very resonant, you know, mm -hmm. then you can, then you can extrapolate from there. And, and it doesn't matter whether she was, you know, wasn't in fact wearing a purple dress, you know, right. Um, it doesn't matter whether my friend Susan had her hair up in a beautiful uh, thing on top of her head or where she had it flowing down her back you know I wanted to remember mm -hmm. it flowing down her back so I so that's what I did <laughs> you know right and I just felt like that was that that was equally plausible <laughs> mm -hmm. oh definitely I think uh, sometimes writers especially younger or untrained writers can feel hamstringed by trying to find the fact when I've taught courses on memory and story, they say, but my sister will tell me I got this wrong. She'll remember it differently. And right. I say, well, it's your truth, right? <laughs> it's your story. I mean, yes. you're, you have to, we have to be daring at a certain point and own the story. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I didn't have too many people that were going to step in. I mean, the, the, the principles were all gone, you know, my mother and grandmother and so on. And my, and my best friend, uh, the, uh, Sue, so she uh, she actually read bits and ch pieces of it before it ever got published, and and she never quibbled with anything I said. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and so, yeah, you you have you have you take the license to do to tell the story. And then the other thing that that was you know kind of tricky for me was figuring out what people would be saying at certain times. Hmm. And, and, and of course you're going to be making some of that stuff up because, right. Because that there's no way you're going to have that all in recall. Mm -hmm. And, and, 
And I found that what was really imp key for me was to listen for the sound of the voice. You know, like I, I can hear my grandmother's voice loud and clear. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I couldn't describe it exactly to people, but it's, it's, it's alive in my head. And because I know that sound of the voice and the cadence of that voice, I can figure out exactly what she would say uh, when we were sitting around before dinner time having drinks or something. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can figure that out right easily because um, there's enough that I know already mm -hmm. about about her, you know, or about the way my mother sounds too. You know, the same thing. Yes, yeah. As an author, a memoirist. Do you feel there's a responsibility to the people in your life who become characters in your book, or do you really place the responsibility on being true to telling your story, presenting your emotional truth? Like where, where is that line of uh, responsibility to the past or to other people or to truth or truth in quotes when you know that subjective truth wow um i really wanted to be tr i wanted the things that i wrote about people to be true about them mm -hmm. yes i really wanted to tell my story and and i really and i was always a truth teller as a kid i was one of those righteous kids that had a hard time lying <laughs> about anything mm -hmm. so <laughs> Um, you know, I, I used my, I brought my father into the narrative because I felt, I, I felt sad about leaving him out in a way I used him in the narrative, um, because I, I, I felt I needed to have another fam, uh, key family person in there. And, and mm -hmm. I wanted to tell the story of a, of a, of a kind of coming together between me and my father that was very important because we had been somewhat, um, not estranged, but we just had been so disconnected. So I used him in a way to, to talk about that. Mm -hmm. But I didn't feel that I, I was being dishonest. I felt that I was being, that if he would, were to read that, um, he would agree that he would agree w with the spirit of it. Right. Um, yeah. And so um, I feel that for the most part, I was I was honoring the people that I used in mm -hmm. in it, and uh, and they and it all sort of fit. It seemed to fit seamlessly with the story, mm -hmm. you know, with with the unfolding of the kind of amazing life I had and all the different sort of pieces of of uh, relationships, the different relationships that I had, right. Right. And what about your audience while you were in the writing process? Was there a point at which you started to think about who's going to be reading this? And, you know, of course, as writers, we craft things for an audience. They aren't in our head. We want to be clear. We want smooth transitions. But what about uh, the piece of emotional vulnerability, feeling perhaps exposed or judged? Did that ever enter into your writing process? I, you know, I didn't, when I, when I was in the process of writing the book, I really, I remember a great momentum of just getting, I, you know, getting through and kind of completing it. And, mm -hmm. and I, and, and it wasn't until later that I started to think about my audience, you know, and, and who is going to read this and, and, and who am I really speaking to, you know, um, and that became a very interesting sort of challenge for me because uh i don't know that i was sure when i was writing it i just thought it was it was felt well, you know obviously i was writing it for myself mm -hmm. it, it was it was like i'm at this point in my life i if i'm ever going to do this i have to do it now and it felt very much that it was serving me but i also really believed that the story i had to tell was a story of of of, of, of human suffering of endurance mm -hmm. of uh, of creativity um, that, that, you know, and ways that you can kind of rise above the difficulties in your life. And, and I felt that, that, it, that I could see the people that it might appeal to, you know, mm -hmm. not, not, I never thought it would only appeal to 
people who wanted to travel. That right. wasn't the point. It, you know, because the, the travel is really, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a means, it's a means to a sort of uh, freedom from suffering in a way. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and it's a means to becoming educated and and more enlightened about about my world. But um, mm -hmm. so it really had to do with people taking you know taking charge of their lives and and realizing they had the capacity. You know to to um, to discover who they are and 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 to and to like who they are. Mm -hmm. Because as a kid, mm -hmm. I didn't like who I was. I I I felt. I didn't, I wasn't, didn't feel loved, you know, so. Right. Right. Is there a point in your life or a point in this memoir, in this narrative of your life where you can say, here's the turning point, here's where I got that lesson and started to like myself? There's one, you weave together um, remembrance and reflection so well. So we're in a scene, we're remembering uh, a scene in a country of traveler we're remembering a scene with your grandmother your mother and then you'll give us some narrative reflection on the piece and there's a moment where you point out that your grandmother made love seem so easy you know yeah. and I maybe that's not the point maybe in hindsight looking back as you wrote this you were like oh look at that but is there a point where the lesson came home and you got it in your being, you know? Oh, that's a really interesting question. You know, one of the things that occurs to me and one of the things that I loved writing about and thinking about was the fact that, that my grandmother was a very spiritual woman in her own very unique way. Mm -hmm. and, and she wanted me to have spiritual, uh, you know, uh, inclinations, but I didn't as a young person. And then, and then, um, and then I did, and and uh, I was thinking about. All, I was wishing so much that I would have been able to have conversations with her and tell her that mm -hmm. I found this sort of um, the beauty of a of a spiritual path, and and I would have loved to. Have, and in my mind, I had these kinds of co communications with her, like mm -hmm. you'd be really happy for me because I found it. You know, and yeah. my grandmother was actually very Buddhist in her, and even though she never would have called herself Buddhist, uh, she because she operated off totally off the principles of of loving kindness and compassion and and mm -hmm. and, and and truth. You know, telling the truth and being and you know, seeing what is real in life. So, yeah, it was like um, that would have that would have been so great. And then I, you know, this sense of the love that she poured into me mm -hmm. and it didn't matter that I didn't have the spiritual life, but, um, um, but I've done enough, you know, kind of sitting with her and this whole, after the whole book was kind of completed and realizing that, you know, her gift to me was, was, was epic. I mean, it, you know, mm -hmm. it, it was really not, it, it was, it's hard to kind of quantify or describe. And, um, and the gift of Buddhism is also epic. It's, 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 it's the mm -hmm. gift of loving kindness. And you have to start by loving yourself. And that's, my grandmother did love herself in a very, very quiet way. She, and I, uh, mm -hmm. and I, that manifested to me, you yeah. know, and, and so it lived inside me. And then when I first went into a, into a, a community of meditators, I realized I was in familiar, I felt like I was in familiar territory mm -hmm. because I was in the midst of loving kindness and understanding and compassion and all that, you know? Right, right. It's like your grandmother's gift prepared you for the Buddhist path and. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Connected those. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. And you have a number of moments where you you just bring things together there's a a burmese merchant and he's got a lacquer begging bowl um that's an antique and you keep asking him is it old is it old is it really old <laughs> and finally he says this bowl you wish to buy is indeed quite old madam please trust me <laughs> 
you must remember that Buddhists never lie. And so you, you buy the bowl and say, this man's words that urged me to trust stayed with me and ultimately helped me find compassion for a little girl who had grown up in a world of half-truths, confusion, and many dark losses, a place where I had trouble holding on to or believing in truth because the ground I traveled on was so very shaky and uncertain. I think so many of us, so many people don't examine their lives in this way. They don't step back, maybe because of the meditation or the mindfulness practice or the lifelong journaling or the grandmother who was so loving and good to you. You have done this work of of reflection, of um, finding the meaning in such small moments. I mean, how many of us would say, trust me, Buddhists don't lie. And you're like, okay, I'll buy the bowl and then never think about it again. Right. <laughs> right. Well, you know, the, the truth telling thing, as I alluded to, was, was very, very important to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the thing between me and my mother that was the thorn, you know, one of the thorns was that I was always trying to get her to tell me the truth. And if you remember, the very beginning of the book is where I'm asking her about my about the discord in my life. And I was scared for my 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 family falling apart mm -hmm. and she wouldn't tell me the truth. And, and, you know, she, she didn't believe in, in, she didn't hold with truth telling. She thought it was, could be awkward and, and uncomfortable <laughs> and whatnot. And I was always poking, you know, po probing. Um, and that was why I became such a, a, a happy student in school because I got to discover things and learn things and, mm. and gather information. And it was, it was very, most satisfying to me, you know, mm -hmm. to do that. Um, and I always wanted to look under the surface of stuff. And of course, my mother didn't, you know, she, you know, and the life that she lived, of course, nobody looked under the surface of anything. Right. And, and it's appropriate because, um, you know, I was born on George Washington's birthday and, um, and George Washington was known to have said, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I didn't chop down the cherry tree. I never mm -hmm. tell a lie. Um, and yes. um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the truth telling and the um, thing is a, a really important thread there. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, you have um, multiple creative passions. There is literature, you reference uh, writers, mm -hmm. classics throughout this art, visual art, you know, painters come up quite a bit, um, cuisine, cooking, the taste of food, a very adventurous palate. It seems you're afraid of nothing that comes before you on a plate. <laughs> I, would, I would squirm at, mm -hmm. at some of those things. Um, how does seeing the world through these different lenses and all of these different sensory experiences affect your writing or affect you as an artist? Well, it, you know, it makes me feel really grateful that I've had the exposure and the education that I've had. Mm -hmm. I mean, my sense about when I completed the book was my God, I, you know, I, I, I didn't realize that I'd had such a rich life. I mean, I'd had an, I had what I thought was a, an interesting and colorful life, mm -hmm. but I but I had been exposed to so much, and uh, and I think that um, it makes me now I, like I want to go back and write about food, and I want to go back and write about books again. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like I have a lot to say, um, and and there's times when I when I start it at, at, at a new idea that I almost feel overwhelmed with the number of things that I'd like to write about. And, right. and so, um, you know, I've, you know, happily completed the memoir and, 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 uh, and I'm sort of promising myself that I'm not going to be a one book writer. I'm going to try, I'm, you know, but it's, 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 there's a distraction in the amount of um, uh, rich stuff that's inside my head. Mm -hmm. And, and how do I, how do I handle that? And how do I, you know, approach it and 
and develop it and so on. Um, right. So it's, it's, it's both wonderful and very, uh, and very distracting. Mm -hmm. uh, Did you yeah. find yourself having to pare back some of the allusions or references that yes. you were weaving into this Absolutely. memoir? In uh -huh. fact, the, the people that were one of my teachers uh, in the course that I took, uh, she, she um, in her very tactful way, told me I didn't need to do so much about the literature stuff. She said, you know, mm -hmm. this is not a book about, of literary criticism. This is not a book about uh, where you're showing off your knowledge of, of, of uh, literature. Um, yes, it's, it's okay to weave it in as, as part of your conditioning and your, your own education as a human, but, but you don't want to go off half cocked and write about, I mean, I wrote much more about James Joyce than mm. originally <laughs> than ended up in there. And I wrote much mm -hmm. more about Bach, you know, when I, when I was in Burma and was writing about Bach. Mm -hmm. um, so, because I got, had such fun writing about it and right. trying and writing about books for me is easier than writing about music for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, because I've been such a, a, a reader and it's, easy as a writer to write about writing than it is to write about art or to write yes. about music. Those are more almost abstract when you think about mm -hmm. it. But, but to, for me to write about uh, books is, I mean, it, it's, it's yummy feeling, you know, like uh -huh. <laughs> why not? And I have lots of books I'd love to go. I'm, I'm writing now about, about Homer's Odyssey because that was a very influential book in my life and in my education. Um, mm -hmm. And clearly James Joyce was too, and as he, as I showed in the, in the memoir. So, um, right. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a fun thing to do. It's, but you have to balance it and, and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you have to realize what your, the intention of your work is. Yes. You know, the next project could have a slightly different intention, you know, so mm -hmm. it might not be as personal. It might not be as intimate. It might be more a brainy thing that I do where I'm kind of looking at the, you know, my intellectual education, which is, which is prodigious. I mean, it was pretty great. Right. You know, um, and, um, and which I'm so grateful for, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, that I got to live in Italy and read Dante, you know, and, and, and then, yes. and, and, uh, and in graduate school, I just devoured Homer and, and the Odyssey. And I, I developed a whole theory about why the Odyssey was so much more magnificent than the Iliad mm. and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I don't know yeah. if I'm answering your, am I answering your question? I sort of. Yes. Yeah. And I think you did a great job of finding the balance point because the uh, training you had, your intellectual qualities came through. It made me want to read those books. You created connections between the references, um, whether to literature or art or music, and your experiences that you were sharing without losing me <laughs> in those, you know, okay, now we're going off. It, it never felt tangential. It always felt like part of the journey and you mention um homer and the odyssey and there's a point in here where you say you've always been fa uh, fascinated by the hero's journey and viewing life or everyone's lives as a hero's journey next week i'll continue my conversation with meg diamond about her memoir bowing to elephants we'll pick up right where we left off, continuing the conversation about how the hero's journey actually applies to each of us and our own lives. Thank you for listening to the StoryWorks Roundtable. Find all our shows, show notes, and videos at storyworkspodcast.com.